Washington both as a Christian and as a praying man rejected the offer to become a monarch. He believed in his own life that there ought to be only one king. A motto that was shouted often during the Revolutionary War was, No king but King Jesus. Do you remember hearing that in the history class? I really don't, but it's in the books. Go read it. It's there. That became the motto of the Revolutionary War. No king but King Jesus. Here is an actual quote from the Revolutionary War found in the Catholic Education website. In 1774, a report to King George of England from the governor of Boston noted, if you ask an American who is his master, he will tell you he has none, or any governor, but Jesus Christ. The pre-war colonial committees of correspondence made this the American motto, no king, but King Jesus. And this sentiment was carried over into the Peace Treaty of 1783 with Great Britain, ending the war, and listen to how the Peace Treaty opening words began. In the name of the most holy and undivided Trinity. No king. With King Jesus. I would suggest to you that maybe the church today needs that similar motto again. You see, it's the human kings of Israel and Judah that got those, that divided nation into a heap of trouble. We discovered last week that the nation of Israel got divided, split into two weaker nations. And during the time of the divided kingdom, there were 38 total kings. And out of 38, only five of them would be considered good. That's not a very good percentage, is it? That's, uh, what, about 11.5%, uh, 12%. During that time, God sent nine prophets to the northern kingdom over a period of 208 years with the intent of calling people back into a right, healthy and blessed relationship with God again. And every single time, the people refused and disobeyed. Today, we will find ourselves in the 16th chapter of the story. I believe that begins at page 219. If you want to get a head start, get turned there. Today, we're going to do two things, as we kind of do every single Sunday off the story. First, we're going to zoom out, and we're going to get a big picture look. And then we're going to zoom in and we're going to get a micro look at the things that are going on within the fall of the nation of Israel. How many of you have ever done Google Earth? You've ever done Google Earth? How, how, how many of you have done your own home on Google Earth? Okay. <laughs> how many of you uh, have never done Google Earth? Raise your hand. It's okay. Okay. How many of you don't have a computer to do Google Earth? Uh, okay. All right. How many of you, one more question like this, how many of you have no idea what I'm talking about when I say Google Earth? Okay, all right, all right, all right. Here, how many of you have seen the little car going around town with a, you know, satellite on top of it, says Google Earth on it? Goes to every neighborhood, takes a picture, all right, of your house, your neighborhood, all right? What Google Earth allows you to do is you can go on your computer, go to Google Earth, type in your street address, and... From up here, it'll give you a look down where you live. And if you hit the plus button on your computer, it gets closer, and you hit it again, it gets closer, and it comes up, and it gets closer, and you can get to where there's nothing on your screen but just your house. In fact, you can look at your front door All right, on Google Earth. You can do a 360-degree tour around your house. See it from the north, the south, the east, the west, go all the way around it on Google Earth. Now, Sometimes they don't have current pictures, okay? Sometimes it's a little bit like, like I looked about a year ago, and, and the picture of our home in Stiff that was pre Shelly, and there were five old junky cars stacked up outside my barn. And, and, and now it's clean as a whistle, okay? It used to be a beige house instead of a green house, all right? But that's why they send those little guys around on a little bitty car, that big satellite, to get updates, all right? So it could be as current as it possibly can. But we're going to kind of do a Google Earth on the story today. Those of us who have been following the story know that Israel, the 
chosen nation of God, which started with a chosen family of God, which came from a chosen man of God, Abraham, all right, to the 12 great-grandsons of Abraham, which became the family that eventually became the nation of Israel. It was at one time all one kingdom under the leadership of Moses and then Joshua, and then they wanted to have a kingdom so they could be like other nations. Saul became the first, followed by David, the greatest of uh, all the kings of Israel. And then Solomon, David's son, the last to reign over the United Kingdom. And as we saw last week, there was Jeroboam and Rehoboam, no relationship to each other, just folks like the Bolognese in those days, all right? And they divided the kingdom into two. Ten nations went one direction, two nations stayed in the south under Jeroboam and Rehoboam. The north was known as Israel, the south was known as Judah. Quite a bit of time passes until we find ourselves in the events of chapter 16 of the story. The year of chapter 16 of the story is about 732 B.C. And the king who was leading Israel at the time is a man by the name of Hosea. Now, King Hosea is not to be confused with the prophet Hosea that we talked about last week. They are not one and the same. One is King. You guys have to be very self-conscious about saying King in church now, okay? I'm trying to overcome it. But we have King Hosea, and then we have Prophet Hosea. Prophet Hosea we looked at last week was a guy that was to call the people of Israel back to a right relationship with him. And remember, God used Hosea to be a living flannel graph illustration, an old-fashioned DVD rendition of a message that God had for them. God told the prophet Hosea to marry who? Gomer. I would like to be married to a woman named Gomer. <coughs> and she was also a hooker. All right? So it was a very interesting story. I don't have time to go back there. But don't confuse the prophet Hosea with King Hosea. Because one of them trusted God, the other one ignored God. And that's King Hosea who ignored him. When Hosea steps into the position as king, half of Israel, his Israel, had already been plundered, and half of the inhabitants had already been exiled to serve in Assyria. Hosea's reality was that he was positioned in the middle between two mega powers. To the right was the country of Assyria, to his left was the country Egypt, and this is the reality that he's nestled in, and he serves as king for nine years. Two kings before Hosea had entered, uh, they had entered into a, a previous relationship with Assyria. And the text, actually, in the old language, uses the word that Israel was a vassal. Not a vessel, a vassal, D-A-S-S-A-L. A vassal means subservient to. In other words, Israel was now the servant of Assyria. Just as once they had been in captivity in Egypt, they are now under the domination of Assyria. What would happen is, annually, Assyria would come into Israel and they would levy against them a heavy tax. Sounds kind of like April 15th, doesn't it? And uh, they would have to write a check then to Assyria. It was a very substantial one. One particular year, King Hosea decides, I'm not sure I want to pay this tax anymore. So he wants to think of a way in which he can get out of it. So what does he do? He goes and he, he, he nestles up with the king of Egypt, which they weren't supposed to do. But he needed help. So he thought, if I can develop an alliance with Egypt, maybe Egypt will provide me with the arsenal so I can stand up against Assyria. Now, side note. While this is taking place, Judah is also choosing to rebel against Assyria. And the king of Judah, Hezekiah, <coughs> and the cow coming in, in a minute. And so it's, his name is, I always have to look, Shalmaneser, who from now on will be called Sal for our conversation today. <laughs> Not to be confused with the fine Mexican restaurant, okay? But Sal is irritated with both Israel and Judah, and so he goes down to visit both of them. He doesn't go alone. He takes his whole army with him, and he asks them a question. 
Who are you depending on that gives you the strength to stand up to me? And I want you to keep that question in the back of your mind. Remember, as we look at this story, we also want to understand something about our story. And so the question that I would challenge you to think about with in your own life today is this question. Who are you depending on as you stand up against the challenges, the difficulties, and the troubles in this world? From the text, we see that Saul leaves Assyria, takes the whole army with him, marches to both nations, wants to let them know what's going on. When they get to Israel, the first thing that they do is they go to Samaria, which has now become the capital city of Israel, and what they do is they go inside the city, and they capture King Hosea, and they imprison him. And that is where King Hosea is for three straight years. They lay siege on the city, and when the dust settles at the end of three years, the nation of Israel, the northern divided kingdom, has breathed its last breath. It goes into extinction. They are finished. They are exiled and never, ever brought together again as a nation. That is the fall of Israel. Some of us are saying, man, this was God's chosen people. Yes, it was part of them. Why did this have to happen? Did God not care? Was God unconcerned? Why did this go on? That's a key question. But the answer really is quite simple. The scripture tells us again and again and again why it happened. It happened because they broke a covenant relationship with God. God had made a covenant with Abraham. God from Abraham all the way to the present day through nine prophets had given them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to be restored to the covenant. And again and again and again, they, they, they foolishly, they foolishly refused the overtures of God to restore to a healthy relationship. Some of you are here today. It's Mother's Day, so you've gotten drunk here by your mother. I am so sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Thank you for being nice to your mother. I'm glad that you are here. But some of you, maybe you're here and you're exploring God. You, you want to know more about who is this God. Some of you are brand new to faith. You're brand new Christians. You're thirsty, you're hungry, you just, you just want to know more. Some of you, many of you, you have been Christians for a long, long time. No matter where we are, understanding this covenant relationship with God is exceedingly important. Israel was in a covenant relationship with God. A covenant relationship is binding. It's binding between God and His people. This divine covenant that they were in was the reality of who Israel was. Three quick things about a divine covenant. First of all, the first thing about a divine covenant is it originated with God. God is the pursuer, all right? It didn't start with man reaching out to God saying, God, can we have some sort of arrangement? This was God reaching out to us saying, I love you. I want to have a relationship with you. Maybe the best way I can illustrate a covenant relationship, many of you are familiar with them. What's this called? Not, not, not the ring, but what, what's it represent? Marriage. That's a covenant relationship. Okay? In every covenant relationship, there's a pursuer and there is a pursuee. Okay? Now, I understand that some women let the men chase them until they're ready to be caught. I, I, I understand that. It's okay. God is the pursuer of this. We are the pursuees. Number two, the second thing in this divine covenant is not only is it originated by God, but since it's originated by God and he is from everlasting to everlasting, this covenant is everlasting. Okay? There's not a time period on this covenant. It is to last forever. Number three, in fact, what's part of the symbolism of a wedding ring? What can you not find on an appropriate wedding ring? You cannot find where it is. Okay? You cannot find where it is. So in a covenant relationship with God, it's never intended to end. The third thing with an everlasting covenant is that they were always marked by a sign or a symbol. For the Jewish nation at that time, the sign and the symbol 
They were the people of God with the circumcision of all the males in Israel. Circumcision. That was the picture. Something different about them than everybody else. As I shared with you before, I'm not sure how anybody else knew they had been circumcised. I mean, did all the Jewish men go around flashing people, all right? I'm God's person. I, here's the reason for that. It took me a long time to figure this out. It's not, it never was intended to be an outward sign visible by the eye. You see, you translate this to the New Testament. The New Testament says, We are no longer the people of God by the circumcision of our flesh, but we are now the children of God by the circumcision of our heart. God has taken away from the human spirit of man when by confession and repentance we see God's forgiveness. The scripture says God then cuts away the sinfulness of the human spirit, so now our human spirit is once again fit for the Holy Spirit of God to come live within the human spirit of our own humanity, and we are now in a covenant relationship with God, and the sign is not by the cutting of the flesh, but it is by the circumcision of our heart. And how is that going to be revealed? When others around us see the difference in our lives, because God lives. Reading Loving God, I read a story where when Colson, after Colson had already spent his time, and uh, Ronald Reagan as president recognizes a particular church for its impact in a particular community in helping the needy. And Reagan said about that particular church, it is not the amount of food and water that they shared with the men and women that made a difference. What made the difference was those men and women knew that someone cared. And that is the mark of God's people. The someones in the world know that there is a God who cares. And he cares through you and me. So Israel was in this covenant relationship with God and they broke it. God was really clear. He was very clear with Moses in Deuteronomy 28, 45 through 48 when he said, These are the curses that will come upon you. They will pursue and overtake you, and you will be destroyed when you do not obey God and observe the commands he gives to you. Because you do not serve the God gladly and joyfully during times of prosperity, when hunger and thirst come, when nakedness and poverty comes, you will serve your enemies. Because you refused and you broke this relationship with God. And in this year, Israel is living out and experiencing the prophetic word of God. How patient was God? When he gave that prophecy to Moses, how many years have gone by? 800 years nearly. 800 years. God was not, he was not quick on the trigger, all right, to show his anger. God was very, very patient, just as he is very, very patient with us. God was not unfair. He was not unjust. When we get to page 219, if you want to, bottom of the page, and it creeps on over to page 220, or if you have a regular Bible with you, this is found in 2 Kings chapter 17, and I'm going to read out of the Bible rather than just the story, because it condenses it a little bit, and I want you to hear the whole thing. 2 Kings 17, 7 through 15. This is in the time frame of where we are of chapter 16. All this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them out of Egypt from under the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They worshipped other gods and followed the practices of the nations that the Lord had driven out before them, as well as the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced. Let me pause for one moment. I made the connection of the covenant relationship to marriage. Okay? I want you to keep that thought in mind as I read these verses. This is talking about how Israel went fooling around with the gods of other nations. Now make that comparison to how you in marriage would feel if your spouse was out fooling around with somebody else's spouse. Make the same analogy. That's the comparison God made for us. Okay? This is what Israel is doing to God. In this marriage covenant, not just with one, not just with two. Let's read on and see what I'm talking about. The Israelites secretly did things against the Lord their God that were not right. From watchtower to fortified city, they built themselves high places in all the towns. They set up sacred stones and Asherah poles on every high hill and up 
under every spreading tree. At every high place they burned incense as the nations whom the Lord had driven out before them had done. They did wicked things that provoked the Lord to anger. Under the tree, on top of the mountains, in the secret places, down the street in the neighborhood, they were found in adulterous relationships with other gods. They worshipped idols, though the Lord had said, you shall not do this. The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and seers, turn from your evil ways, observe my commands and decrees, in accordance with the whole law that I commanded your fathers, and that I delivered you to you through my servants, the prophets. But they would not listen. In this passage, we see that Israel had been worshiping wherever they wanted to and whoever they wanted to. Their worship was all messed up. If you were in a marriage with a husband and a wife who was doing this, would you say that marriage was all messed up? Yeah, we would. Unless we're the one doing the messing up. Then we'd close our ears. And that is what Israel had done. 2 Kings 17, 16 through 18, it says, They forsook all the commands of the Lord their God, and they made for themselves two idols, cast in the shape of calves, and an Asherah pole. They bowed down to all the starry hosts, and they worshipped Baal. They sacrificed, <coughs> they sacrificed their sons and their daughters in the fire. They practiced deviation and sorcery, and sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, provoking him to anger. And in verses 14 and 15 in the story, top of page 220, it says, They would not lessen, listen, and they were as stiff-necked as their ancestors. They rejected the decrees and the covenants that he made, and they did not trust the Lord their God. And in spite of all this, God continues to move towards his people in spite of their disobedience. He spoke to them through prophets like Hosea, who said, Go by, go her back, bring her home, who love her as if she had done nothing wrong. Why? Because that's what I want to do with my people. I, he does whatever he can to reach out to you and me to bring us back into a healthy, everlasting relationship with him. God continued to move towards him with great love, reminding what would happen when he continued to break the covenant. They turned to everyone else. And in 722 B.C., northern Israel, the ten tribes, were finished. They were exiled to Assyria, never to be a nation again. From an upper story view, seeing God's angle, looking through God's lens, looking down, God loved his people. He called them again and again to himself, yet they ran and broke the relationship. <clears throat> when we begin to zoom in on the story, we see something emerging from this story that is fascinating. When we zoom in, we see some fine print that will absolutely, I think, blow your mind. We see two emerging stories being told at the very same time. We see the story of the northern kingdom, Israel, led by King Hosea, in the south, Hezekiah. Judah being led by King no, Hezekiah, <laughs> Sal's the Assyrian guy who likes Mexican food. Okay, Sal's the guy who's in charge of Assyria. We've got Hezekiah, who is the king of Judah, the southern division of Israel. We have King Hosea, the king of the northern uh, ten tribes of Israel, and we see these two stories going on at the very same time. Two stories get juxtaposed. Isn't that a great word? Juxtaposed over each other. Very different. In the northern kingdom, we see them experiencing death. In the southern kingdom of Judah, they are experiencing life. See, out of the southern kingdom, Judah, is where eventually the Messiah is going to come from. They live, the other nation dies. Who's king of your world? Hosea? Hezekiah. God? You. Who's king? What's so very important. I began to wonder how this could be. I mean, located right between two world powers, Assyria and Egypt. They've got the same situation. Judah has the same situation as Israel. And yet, one dying, the other one is living. Two kings. They were to be in the same relationship covenant with God. And in the north, they're facing death. 
left and south for chasing lines. The answer is found. There are three key misconceptions. Let me back up on this. Hezekiah is known as the greatest king of Judah. Next to King David, who reigned over both Israel and Judah, Hezekiah is known as the second greatest king of all time in Israel. But known as the best of Judah. There are three misconceptions of God that Hosea lived and led the people from. And Hezekiah, on the other hand, is led by three key truths. Let's look at these as we parallel them. The first misconception that Hosea lived and led the people of Israel under is that God is not interested in them. God is not interested in them. Have you ever lived your life under that misconception that God does not care about you? If you've ever lived that way, or if you're living that way right now, pay attention to what happened to Hosea and Israel as they lived their life under that misconception that God does not care. So what did he do? Hosea began to turn to idols, gods he could make out of his own hand, out of his own imagination. Why? So he could touch them and hold them. Even though he created them, he knew their beginning, he would know their end because he had made them himself. It was something that he could touch and feel and see. Remember, it's Hebrews 11, 1 that teaches us that faith is being sure of what we hope and confident of what we cannot see. Yet Hosea was living out the misconception that God is uninterested, though year after year after year, he's letting them know how much he loves them. This produced within Hosea a blindness where he couldn't see past his nose. If he were just to turn around and look at the past, he would see that God was interested. If he would turn around and look at the past, if he would go to Gilgal, where was Gilgal? Inside, okay, it's kind of like, it's going to be kind of like me going to Washington, D.C. Okay? On our streets in Washington, D.C. is the Washington Memorial and the Lincoln Memorial and the war memorial, all in about five blocks. When I walk down that street, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to remember some of the stories of Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to remember some of the events of George Washington. I'm going to recall and reflect upon the war memorial and the cost and the sacrifice. I am not going to forget the things that have shaped and molded this nation to be who we are. We go by those places. They're called a memorial for a reason. We are to remember. And Gilgal was 12 stones built an altar on the right side of the Jordan River when Israel crossed over from the desert to the promised land. And God said, build this altar. And every time you come by here, tell your children, your grandchildren, about what God has done for them. Do not forget God's story. And they forgot. Now, down in the south, King Hezekiah did not live under this misconception that God is uninterested. He lived out the truth that God is active and caring. To understand a little bit more of Hezekiah and what this man was like, we find in 2 Kings 18.5, the scripture says, He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him in all the kings of Judah, nor were there any before him in Judah, for he clung to the Lord. He did not depart from him. He kept his commands just as he had commanded Moses. Isn't that a beautiful phraseology? He clung to the Lord. Now, ladies, I know you don't like your dresses when they cling to you. All right? Now, I have to be honest, most of us men do. But that's another story. That's another story, okay? But here's the deal. Yesterday, Mike and Patricia Crouch uh, came over to our home to visit for a little bit. Mike, give us an update on this horrendous back surgery he had had up at UCSF how his improvement was doing, and to talk about a few things. And, and, and after a little while of visiting him, he was attempting to go for a walk. So we went for a walk down, down a little field, and in our conversation, I found out that, that he had been